<laughs> have a seat right there for now. Uh, so sorry to put you on the spot. I was just sharing with them. I didn't trust myself to leave enough margin at the end of the service to be able to adequately pray for you. So I kind of, in midstream, decided to go ahead and do it now. Um, originally, I had wanted to do this as like the whole focus of a service when we got to Act 6, which is where we're first introduced with this idea of having men that would come alongside the pastor and support that ministry. Um, but that would have meant waiting another six weeks before we got to it. And I just didn't want to wait. We waited long enough. Virginia said it well. It's about time. Uh, but I did want to talk just briefly about that because it, it leads into what is so significant about the deacon ministry. Uh, if you remember the history, there's conflict in the church. And it's internal conflict over whose widows are getting taken care of better than whose widows. And it's great that somebody was standing up and saying, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Someone's being left out. Someone's not being cared for. But what I love about the wisdom of the apostles at the time is they recognized that their ministry was different from what needed to take place. Their ministry was to feed on and to serve God's people on the, the Word of God. And that is been passed down to us as pastors. Our job, our ministry, our focus is God's word and prayer and leadership and direction of the church. And so what was needed then and what is needed now is for someone else to come alongside that ministry and not have a less significant or less important ministry, but a ministry that is just as vital but is focused in a different way on caring for the practical needs of God's and they recognized very early on that if we're going to have someone do this, it needs to be someone who's full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. Someone who is godly. Someone who is trustworthy. And I love the way all of that works out in God's Word is that when they choose these men and they pray over them and they give them that, that service opportunity to God's people, it says that there came peace and that God's people were blessed and that the church grew. That's the significance of this ministry. Sometimes we act like what they do isn't all that important. And sometimes we act like what God gave them to do isn't all that important. So we give them other things to do. And we, we treat them like a board of directors. And we give them administrative tasks that pull them away from what God ordained or set apart deacons to be doing. And that is to support the pastor's ministry by taking care of God's people. And that's why I love or a part of what I love about this church is that our people get that and we set our deacons free to do that and we expect them to take care of God's people. We expect them to be in the hospital. We expect them to be in prayer. We expect them to be caring for our widows because you go back to the beginning and that was the expectation. And Charles has done that for a long time. And it's been so fun to watch over the last five years. Every time we've asked you guys for nominations for deacon, his name has come up. And every time we've gone to him, he said, no, not right now. A little more time, same process. A little more time, same process. And then what happened is people just decided, well, if he's not going to accept the role, we're just going to consider him a deacon anyway. And so everybody just started treating him as a deacon, expecting him to be a deacon. Why wasn't Charles up there praying with you guys? Why doesn't Charles do that? Because he's not a deacon. Well, he should be. I agree but not until he's ready. And one day we had a conversation, and uh, we were standing right up here, and Charles came to me and said, I want you to know, and somebody had contacted him, and he wanted to pass that information on to me. And then he chuckled, and he said, they still think I'm a deacon. And I said, well, maybe you should take a hint. And he about knocked me over because he said, maybe I should. But I left it alone for a little while. I didn't want to push him. I wasn't sure if he was joking with me, or if he was serious. And so we gave a little bit more time, and Charles got sick, and he had a, a little bit of a rough time. And so we decided on a Sunday night, we were going to use that Sunday night for ministry. We all came here and prayed, and we took off all over the place. We had three or four people in the hospital during that time. Charles was down, so we had people that went to two different hospitals, I believe, and a group of us went to Charles' house, and we decided on the way we were going to gang up on him. And so we had a great visit in his living room with him and his beautiful wife, Glenna. And we talked about the church, and we talked about their health, and we talked about ministry. And then I dropped the bomb. I said, Charles, in front of everybody, what do you think about this? Would you do this? 
would you do this in honor of your friend Troy? We said yes. And we cried and we prayed and we celebrated. Um, and he has done an amazing job. We we called him along with Jason Troy and, and Greg Shirley a, a deacon in training, but he really has not been. He's been a deacon in training. His training was, was probably decades ago. He's been doing the job, but we wanted to go through the process because I want to establish it firmly in our mind. Uh, of the way we need to train guys up so that they're prepared for this when the time comes. Um, and so we've had that privilege now for almost a year um, to, to let him go through the process, to let him serve alongside us, to pray with us, to serve you, um, and to just get used to the way we do deacon ministry. And now today we get to ordain him or set him apart for that ministry. Um, and so um, let's grab a couple of chairs then. Because Glenna, you should come on with him. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this or not, but there's actually roles and responsibilities for people's wives in the Bible. We don't talk about it very much. But for me, what that says, you guys can see on these lovely chairs that didn't make it to the cleaning when we cleaned the others. Um, what, what that means for me in my understanding of God's Word is that this is a partnership. He can't do what he's called to do if there's not support at home. But also, there are some situations that he should just not go charging into all by himself. And it's wise to have your spouse, your helpmeet, there with you. Um, and so that's what's beautiful about this partnership. Although we don't ordain women in our understanding of God's scripture, what we understand is that this is a couple that is set apart for ministry. And the responsibility for that ministry falls on his shoulders. But she is a vital part of that, and, and Glenna does a beautiful job of supporting him and encouraging him and supporting us and encouraging us and just being a part of everything that is within this church. So um, so let's take a couple of minutes and pray for them. Um, guys, if you would come, um, Chris, would you mind leading this prayer? And anyone that would like to just kind of gather around them and support, lay hands on them as a part of this, you are welcome. I don't want to exclude you from this in any way. If you just don't feel like getting up, you know, that's fine. God hears your prayer and your support from where you are. But if you, if you want to come in close, this is a family opportunity um, for us to bless them, be blessed by them, and share this with them. If you guys get on in and settle. There you go. That's good. I like that. I like that. <laughs> That's all right. There you go. Be creative. I like it. That's working. Oh, we're getting all connected now. All right, brother, would you pray for me? Heavenly Father, what an honor it is to come in your presence and to pray for Charles and for Glenna as well. Uh, Lord, we lift them up to you. What a, a godly a set of people. We have before us, and they strive to glorify you in all that they do as far as we know, as far as we see on a daily and a weekly basis, Lord. Uh, but we make it official, Lord, that we pray for Charles um, as he takes on and accepts this role to be a deacon and to serve you um, under the example that you gave, Lord, when you stepped out of heaven and came here not to be served but to become a servant, and a servant that benefits all of us who place our faith in you. Lord, you came to die, that we might have life, real life. And Lord, we ask that you would guide uh, Charles, uh, as you always have, with wisdom and uh, with just the love um, that he has for the flock that's here to help uh, be a... Um, the helper to our pastor and to all of those that are here. Lord, in this family, we love them so much, Lord, and we just ask that you would guide him with wisdom and with love and with understanding and with patience uh, as we, as a team of deacons and the pastor and the other uh, staff, serve you by serving those that are part of this family. Lord, we're so thankful for him. And just pray that you'll continue to give him good health and uh, to uh, 
help uh, Glenna to be that help me to him and to support him in this endeavor. Lord, we thank you so much. And we ask all of these things in your mighty and your precious name. Amen. 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 Well, I am excited about being able to jump into the book of Acts with you. It is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It was one of the first um, one of the first books that I, I was able to study uh, when I first went to Bible school. Um, I was still working for Polk County EMS then. I think my first set of classes, um, I jumped in with Acts, and it was just transformational for me. And so for a long time, I've wanted to go through this together as a group, but have just been waiting on and praying on God's timing for it. Uh, and this just seems like the right time. So we're going to be going through Acts over the next several months with some breaks. We'll break, of course, for Easter. There may be a couple of other things that we will break for. Um, but, but we're going to be focusing on this till we get done. Now, for some, that has raised some concerns. I've had at least a couple of people that have come to me and said, wait a minute now, Acts has 28 chapters, and you said that this is going to be about being a witness. Like, are you going to beat us up for 28 weeks about being a witness for Christ? No, I'm not. I promise you that. Um, I, I want you to understand that although that is like the overarching theme of the way we're going to be approaching the book of Acts, everything every week is not going to be like the same sermon over and over again talking about the fact that you need to be a witness. Now, we are going to talk about that because that is one of the great themes of this book. Uh, for me, as we go through uh, this, our theme verse is going to be Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses. And so we are going to talk about our responsibility to be witnesses. We're going to talk about how we should be sharing Christ with others. We're going to talk about how we should do that with the things that we say, but then also with the things that we do. But that's not going to be the only thing that we talk about every week because there are some other major things that you see throughout the book of Acts. So we're also going to look at the expansion of the early church. And if you have never studied this and have no idea how it went from 120 original believers at the beginning of Acts, approximately, they, at least that's the first number we're given, 120 of them are meeting in the upper room for prayer and, and all of that stuff. How does it go from that to thousands and then to millions? If you have no idea how this happened, you're going to learn that over the next several months as we go through. And so I'm going to try to do some things to help you to visualize that. We're going to have some maps um, and we're going to look at how how things expanded and who the key people were that God used to help it to expand. But the other major thing that we're going to talk about is that, that God has the power to transform lives. That's really what this all comes down to. It's not just about telling people about Jesus so that they hear the name or so that they accept a way of living or so that they start to go to church. I mean, those are all good things, but that's not the purpose of the gospel. That's not what coming to know Christ is about. It's also not just about having a, a seat reserved in heaven and a place to go when we die. It's about being transformed in the here and now, that he changes our hearts, that he changes the way that we think, which then ultimately changes the way that we live, so that we can represent him here and now. And so if you kind of bottled it, boiled everything down to three things. Those are the three things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at some specific people and how they lived out being witnesses. We're going to look at how, as the result of that, the church grew and it spread all through the known world at the time. But then we're also going to look at individuals who were radically changed. So look with me, if you would, please, at Acts chapter 1. We're going to start by reading the first eight verses. Luke writes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, and after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the end, I'm sorry, the ends of the earth. So the first obvious thing that I want us to talk about this morning is that we are called very clearly to be witnesses. This is not the job of just pastors. This is not the job of just deacons or Sunday school teachers or anybody with a, a title. This is our job. This is what we are called to do. And, and I would go so far to say and this part of our identity and who we are is more important than the career that we have. It's more important than the money we have in the bank. It's more important than the house that we have or the 401k that we're working for or the retirement that we either are enjoying now or hope to have one day. This should be our identity that we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. As we go through Acts, what we're going to see is that this was a natural process for them. And we struggle with it today. But here's the thing. Although... Right, so, so going just for a second into um, Bible interpretation and teaching, one of the things that we have to understand is the original audience. And I am not denying that when Jesus spoke these words, he didn't say, here's a message for the church. He was talking to people who were standing right in front of them. You will receive power. Remember, he just said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. You people right here, you'll receive power and you will be my witnesses. However, what we see over time is that, that that baton is passed to each generation. We've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've received salvation through Jesus Christ. And we've received the mission of being his witnesses. So let's talk for just a, a minute about some of the things that we are called to be witnesses to. And first and primary is uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. Turn with me real quick, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 15. We talk a lot about the gospel, the gospel message. We need to preach the gospel. It's the gospel that saves. It's the gospel that transforms. But for a lot of us, that's just a word we throw around. I want to kind of put some flesh on that this morning so that we understand exactly what that message is. Because if we don't, then it can get watered down to a lot of things. And in today's culture within the church, one of the things that's getting watered down to be is just behavioral uh, change. When we teach God's word as though it's just something to change our behavior, if you would just understand these three principles, then you can change this in your life and everything's going to be okay. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is utter transformation, and that can only come from one message. Paul wrote to the Corinthians a bit later than what we're reading this morning in 1 Corinthians 15 with a reminder of that message. He said, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you which you receive, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, in other words, what was given to him, and we're going to see in Acts where this message came to him and how he received it, but he's telling them, what I received, I've passed on to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing that you can understand, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. So what Paul was reminding them of, and what we need to remember if we're going to be witnesses, is that the message is Christ. I encourage you to share your testimony, but that's not the message. It's a part of God's story. But the message is Jesus. The message is that God loved the world so much that he gave his son, that his son would come and die for our rebellion and for our walking away from God. The message is that the spotless, sinless, perfect Lamb of God died the death that I should have died. But then that we have hope that he didn't stay in the grave. He died and he raised again. Over and over, we're going to see that repeated throughout the book of Acts for a couple of reasons. One is because that's the core message, but two, they used the resurrection as their verification that all of this stuff was true. Notice some of the things that, that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It's like, in case you didn't know, when Jesus came back, he appeared to all of the apostles, and then he appeared to 500 people at one time. Then he appeared to his brother James, and then last of all, he appeared to me. These are all people that would have still been alive, as Paul wrote them. 
And in the same way, that's why Luke begins by saying, in my first book, in Luke, I told you about what Jesus began to teach and to do. Now in Acts, in our terminology, the sequel, Luke part two. Now I'm going to tell you about what happened after his resurrection, after he appeared to the apostles, because that is foundational to our belief. It's not just something we celebrate on Easter. It's not just something to think about one day a year. It is the core of everything that we believe. If he didn't walk out of the grave, then our hope is in vain. And so the gospel that we preach and what we teach and what we're a witness to is that Jesus died in our place, that he rose again, and that through that there is power for transformation. That it's not just about, I hope I get to heaven one day. It's not just about that when I die I get reunited with people that I miss and that I love. It's not just about that I escape from hell. It's about complete and utter transformation. We are not cleaning up some bad habits, but as the scripture says, walking from death to life. I heard someone say recently, as a comedian of all, all, all people, that, that, that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but to make the dead alive. And we get that messed up. And it is with good intentions. We want to do better. We want to try harder. We want to clean up our act. But God didn't come to make something that was dirty clean again. He came to make something that was dead alive. And that is so much greater than just getting some bad habits out of our lives. That means that we can walk through anything that this world brings to us. And we can have peace. And we can have joy. So again, as we go through the book of Acts over the next several weeks, we're going to see how the believers walk through those things. We're going to see how they shared that message. We're going to see how people are transformed. And we're going to see that the power for all of that is God's. The reality is, I believe at least from conversations that I've had with people and from experience, that part of the reason we are so fearful of this idea of evangelism is because we think the power rests within us. We think that I've got to have the right words to convince someone. I've got to have a good testimony. I shied away from telling my testimony for a long time because I didn't have a good testimony. I grew up in church. I didn't do bad stuff because I was afraid to and because I wanted people to like me. If you were a Sunday, if you, for those of you that have been kids, Sunday school teachers, I would have been the one that you liked because I didn't say anything in class except in response to the questions you asked. Not because it was the right thing to do. Not because I was trying to honor God. I wanted you to like me. And that just never seemed like that great of a testimony until I met other people who were struggling with trying to be good enough and trying to earn God's approval in that way. And that's when I learned those are the people that can hear my testimony and relate to it. And my testimony is different from yours on purpose. But even in all of that, it's not our power that changes things. Go back with me if you would to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He begins by saying, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The Holy Spirit had operated in a different way in the Old Testament, and everything was going to be radically new now. And in the way that God normally presents new things, he made a big deal of out of it. And so Jesus is telling them, wait, because this is still going to happen. Go to Jerusalem and wait. You will know when the Holy Spirit comes. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you will have power. And the power of the Holy Spirit will allow you then to share this message. And in that power, you're going to see people changed. And so we're going to talk about people like Peter. Think back to what you know about Peter before Acts. Start off, he's a rough fisherman. But then he's also that guy that most of us identify with and most of us like because all through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way through you see Peter saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing. You see Peter is quick to speak, and every time he does, he puts his foot in his mouth, it seems like it. Like there's one time recorded in the Gospels that I can think of where he says the right thing. God, Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the Christ. And then immediately after that, he says something dumb. And we love that about Peter because we are just like that. But what we're going to see moving into Acts is that God utterly transforms him through the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit living within him. He goes from that guy to a strong and secure and capable leader. He stands up in Acts 2 and preaches an amazing sermon based off of what's going on around him. 
And all through stories like that, we're reminded that it is God that does it and not us. I shared with you a little while ago about some of the some of the um, some of the times that I come up, and as much as I tried, as much as I've tried to block out time or whatever, I've not been able to be as prepared as I would like on Sunday morning sometimes. And what has been amazing to me is the time where I come in and I almost want to start the sermon by apologizing. Because I just always, I feel like that's my responsibility. And no matter how much the week was out of my control, I feel like it was my responsibility to study. And then I start doubting, should I have just stayed up all night? You know, just all those things are going in my mind. And so, so, so I'll come up and I'll give it my best. And sometimes I'll walk off and I'll sit down and I'll think, man, that was just bad. And it's those times that God reminds me that it's not me and it's his power. Because someone will come up to me and say, that was the most powerful sermon I have ever heard. And God has utterly changed me too. And then in case I don't get those messages, there are the times that I prepare really well (laughs) and nobody remembers them. And God says over and over, it is me and it is not you. The thing I want you to take away from that is this. You don't have to be afraid to share. You don't have to be afraid to speak up for Christ. If you think all the way back to um, John 14 through 16, as Jesus talks to the, 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 the disciples about the coming Holy Spirit, he promises them that the Spirit is going to remind them of things to say. He promises them all these things that the Holy Spirit is going to do in their lives, and those promises hold true for us. So we don't have to worry. That doesn't mean we don't prepare. It doesn't mean we don't study. It doesn't mean that we don't learn. It doesn't mean that we don't practice. It just means that I don't have to sweat the details. I do what I've been called to do, and that is to be a witness, and I trust that God's going to work through that through his Holy Spirit and understand Understand that he is the only one that can change a heart. <clears throat> and we're also going to see a radical transformation in Paul. The first time that we meet Paul, <clears throat> we're going to see him as a group of people are stoning one of the first deacons. We talked a little bit about that before we prayed for uh, before we prayed for Charles. Out of that original group of deacons, there's one that comes out named Stephen. In the next couple of chapters, we see him preaching and teaching and doing great things. And then we see him die. And as we're introduced to Paul, then called Saul, he's literally guarding the coats of the guys who are stoning that saint and approving of what they're doing. And then God utterly shakes him and transforms him in a way that only he could. And we see him being one of the primary catalysts for the expansion of the church. We're also going to see as we go through Acts that the strategy that God has given us is huge. He directly spoke to them and he told them how the church was going to expand. And we're going to see that as we go through Acts. We're going to see that it begins. Well, let's just pick it up. Verse 8 again, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he told them, remember, go wait in Jerusalem. So for them, very literally, Jerusalem was the place where they were, where they were waiting for the Holy Spirit. He said, I want you to start there. I want you to work there. But then I want you to go all through Judea and Samaria. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that this really came significant for me. I think it was as I was going through the book of John studying again, and I saw how much they hated Samaria that I realized that when Jesus, I truly believe, when he told them to go to Judea and Samaria, Judea surrounds Samaria. So it wasn't, it's not, I I had always thought of that before, like saying go to Polk County and go to Florida and then go to the United States. But really what he was doing was, doing for them was not challenging them to go to a place that was geographic in nature, but to go to a place that they just didn't want to go. In their day and time, people went out of their way to avoid Samaria. And he said, for you, I want you to take this good news, this message that has transformed you. And don't go around Samaria. Don't avoid them because you don't like them. Go right there. We're going to see that happen. And then, of course, he tells them that eventually, one day, this is going to go to the ends of the earth. I know we've got to go, so I want to wrap some things up real quick by just showing you a couple of pictures. One is, this is the travels of Paul. And I just use that to to illustrate how far in their day and time the gospel went. They started here. This was, this was it, remember? Start in Jerusalem. And then go to Judea and Samaria. And then go to the ends of the earth. All of these dots on the map are places where they traveled. 
where they shared Christ, where churches were started. Just in one lifetime, in one generation, it did that. But we've got to understand that God had the power to do that, and the same God still has the power to transform this world, and there are still places that need it. This is called the 1040 window. That is an area within the world, ironically, that covers part of where everything started, where there is the least access to the gospel. And where many of the governments and even people groups don't want to hear the gospel because they are so focused on their way of thinking and on the, the belief system that they have. And I show you that not to say that we all need to quit what we're doing and go be missionaries there. But primarily as the eye opener, the realization that there is still work to do. There is still work to do right here in Highland City. There's still work to do right here within this church. There's still work to do within our families. But there's definitely work to do within the world. And we need to then not let this idea of being a witness, being used for Christ, making a difference in the world, get pushed aside for other lesser things. There are a lot of lesser things that we donate or dedicate a lot of time and resources to. And it just shouldn't be that way. This should be the cause. Everything that we do, like we set aside money for all kinds of other things, but very rarely are we willing to set aside significant amounts of money to fund mission work. It's great that we're going to work together and pull together to send the kids to camp, and I want us to do that. But we also know missionaries who have financial needs. Are we willing to pull together and rally around them and sacrifice wants? Here's the thing. For most of us as Americans, we're not really in danger of sacrificing need. There's probably not anyone in this room that's had to go without a meal in order to put money towards something else. There might be a few, but there are not many of us. There are not many of us that have had to, had to worry about having a place to live because we've had to set aside money for other things. So I'm not talking about giving up basic needs. I'm talking about giving up wants and desires, that extra meal out. Cable. the gas guzzler, whatever it might be, that we would be willing to think strategically about those things and order our lives around being witnesses here, being witnesses as far as we can go from our church, but also funding that work all over the world. In, in terms of something more local, I'll tell you a quick story, and then I'm going to ask you to do some things. Part of this story, some of you guys have heard before, but... Um, a couple of weeks ago after uh, my uncle died and our family all got together, my grandmother started telling some stories again. And she filled in some dots with the story that I didn't know previously. So sometime in the late 50s or 60s, after my grandmother and mm -hmm. my grandfather and the kids that they had at the time, I think they were all born, so all the kids, um, they were in a one-room home out where my grandmother still lives today. And they bought that little one-room house, and they built onto it little by little over the years. Not too long after they had settled into the community and had started building what was first going to be a porch, and then later would be what we know now as like the living room area, a deacon from a local church came by. And, and this, for me, ever since I first heard this story, has epitomized the idea of a deacon, because he didn't come and just immediately say, we have a revival service, we'd like for you to come. He didn't come and just immediately say, let me tell you about Jesus. Are, are you guys acquainted with him? Do you, do you know about Christ or any of that stuff? What he did was he came and he <laughs> welcomed them to the community. As he welcomed them, they were working. And so he took off his coat and his tie and he rolled up his sleeves and he grabbed a hammer and he helped my grandfather build that patio. And then, I'm not talking about like one afternoon, like he came back repeatedly and he helped them finish that because that was what people did back then. He helped them finish that patio area. And then he said, we have a revival service coming, would you join me? My grandmother at that time was the only believer in the household. And it's a really long story. I wish you guys could hear my 99-year-old granny tell you this story. I'm going to shorten it by saying, that as a result of that man, as a result of his witness, 
My grandfather, every child, committed their life to Christ. I grew up in a Christian home because of a man whose name I do not know. Because he cared enough about his community and he cared enough about the souls of others to step in and do some hard work and then to point that family to Christ and to walk with them. And it was a long journey. My grandfather was obstinate for a lot of years after that. And it wasn't until my grandfather came to know Christ that the boys in the family followed his example. Because one man said, I'll be a good man. So what I'm asking you to do this morning is to not be that bold to begin with. I'm not asking you to go out and to share Christ with anyone today. But what I'm asking every one of you to do is the next baby step. And that is, would you think of one person in your life that doesn't know Christ, and would you pray for them? Now, I'll be honest, I have an ulterior motive in this, because here's what I know what will happen. If you begin to pray for them, you will love them enough eventually to talk to them. But I'm not asking you to talk to them today. I'm just asking you to pray for them. I'm also asking you to do some Bible study. Now, for those of you that are doing the Bible app that we mentioned earlier, um, if you look at it today, at the end of the message, there are two Bible reading plans in there for you. One uh, is taking you through the book of Acts. It's 28 days long, I believe. Um, and we'll walk you through the whole book of Acts. The other one is one that I think is just five lessons on evangelism. And, and I went through and read some excerpts of it, and it's just about focusing our mind and our heart in on the need and caring enough about people uh, to be willing to pray for them and to share Christ with them. So I commit those to you if you'd be willing. Um, if you don't have the Bible app, just read through the book of Acts. That's going to begin to transform you. And that's going to help you to prepare for the things that we talk about. As much as we can each week, we're just going to hit a new chapter. We're not going to be able to hit every story and every event. So today, that was the summary for chapter 1. Chapter 2, we're going to hit next week, then 3, and then 4. There's some of them that we'll, we'll, we'll bypass, but reading them is going to help you to get the background. The last thing I ask you to do is to commit to doing some training. Over the next year, we're going to have a handful of different training opportunities for you that are going to take different forms. But the one that I want to highlight the, the most right now, not just because it's the next upcoming, uh, because, but because I think it's one of the most significant for us, and that's the I Neighborhood uh, uh, seminar we've been talking to you about. It's on March the 3rd. It is a whole day from 8.30 to 4. Um, but, but here's what this does that I love so much. It's not a new program. You remember like EE from a long time where it was a program like you met on Tuesday nights, you discipled people, and you took them out and you knocked on doors. It's not that kind of a thing. What it is is doing what we ought to do as Christians, just in an organized way. And so through our neighborhood, we will form three teams. The first team is people that will say, I will go talk to my neighbors. I will talk to people at work. I will openly build relationships and share Christ. Team two is prayer people. You're just going to pray for those people who are going to share, and you're going to pray for the people that they are sharing with. Team three is our guys that are going to go, and women, who are going to go pick up hammers and hacksaws and hedge trimmers and lawnmowers and meet physical needs in order for team one to be able to more effectively share Christ. So during that seminar, then we're just going to talk about that process and what it would look like for us and how we get started. And I would love to have at least 20 of you Come and spend time together on that day in prayer for our community and learning and being equipped. If you can't make it, stay tuned. We will still let you know how you can get involved after that. There will be other training opportunities. But we really need to get some folks here because the more people we have on the same page, the more effective we're going to be at getting this done. Let me pray for you and we will go. God bless you. I am thankful for you and the work that you are currently doing. And that is one thing I want you to hear clearly from me as we go. I am always, I promised you from the beginning, I am always going to challenge you to stretch. I am always going to challenge you to do more and to be more faithful. But in the process of doing that, please don't ever hear me say that I'm not thankful for you right now. And that I'm not proud of you right now. And that I'm not thankful for the opportunity to serve with you right now. But there's just more work to do. Father, we thank you for this time together. And we thank you for your word. And we thank you for those that have gone on before us that have set the precedence and that have shown us what it looks like to be a witness. God, I pray that you would bless these times of worship, these times of in, uh, in your word, and that you would help us to be transformed. God, we thank you again for Charles and Glenna and for bringing them into uh, our deacon ministry. God, we pray that you would work uh, in 
in a significant way in Charles's life, and use him for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.